the voice of the Lord. You know, I want to take you to the 10th chapter of the great book of Revelation. I want to refresh your memory of what is written in chapter 9. The sixth trump was sounded and four bound angels were, which means they were bad, were released at the river Euphrates. And when the swarmers swarm, they're there. And it's, it is our duty and obligation to our Father to pay close attention and recognize what's going down and at what time. So let's pick it up, if we may, with those thoughts in mind. Maybe we'd better take uh, verse 18 to know what to expect from the swarm and from those four bound uh, uh, angels. Verse 18 said, And by these three was a third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by brimstone. In other words, all their, uh, out of their mouth. In other words, they're blowing smoke. Smoke won't, uh, hot air won't hurt you necessarily if you're back far enough. In other words, they lie to people. They mislead people. And they do it how? In a religious sense. And that deceives many, many people. Now, let's, with a word of wisdom, let's pick up the 10th chapter and let's go a little deeper into this. Verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, meaning royalty, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Verse 2, and he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. That simply means he had power and control over both the earth and waters. And our Father does, this not being our Father, but certainly a representative of His. Verse 3, And He cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when He had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. What are these seven thunders? What a mystery. What a wonder. Well, let's see if we can find out. Verse 4, and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I mean, they communicated, you got it? It was a voice. I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. Write them not. Don't you put them down. But now, I, I want you to bear something in mind. What did he have in a little book? He gave him the book. But he said, don't write it down exact is what it means. But it's something we're going to understand. Okay? When the time is right and when we are supposed to know, we will understand. And, uh, and so it is. Um, verse 5, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, praying to God, looking to God. 6, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. In other words, we've come right up to the end. So it behooves one to understand Let's, let's back up for a second, back to chapter 4 of this great book of Revelation. What does it say there in chapter 4 in verse 5? Let me read it to you. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Well, what are those spirits of God, and who, what are those seven thunders, the voices? Well, um, you know what lightning is. Lightning precedes thunder. Skip on over to chapter 5, verse 12, and let's pick up on the Spirit of God just a little bit here. Verse 12 of chapter 5, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, that's one, Riches, two. Wisdom, three. 
strength four, and honor five, and glory six, and blessing seven, the spirits of God. Now, how, how can we anchor this? Do you know God always foretells his prophets? It's written. He, he doesn't do anything without letting you know what's about to transpire. So what you need to know, what is the voice of God? How, how can we tell? Psalms 29. Let's uh, go there and let's see if we can discern a little more. Psalms 29. Psalms 29, and what a beautiful psalm it is, the psalm of David. Verse 1, give unto the Lord, O you mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. There's two of the attributes in that first verse, glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness, that's righteousness. Verse 3, the voice of the Lord, here you are, that's why we came here. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters, the God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon the waters. When God speaks, it is recorded as thunder. And you can, you can take that, but the order has been given. Thunder follows that. And if you wait too long after the thunder, you miss the boat because you're supposed to have the prophecy to know and understand. And then the truth prevails, the truth comes forward. Verse four, the voice of the Lord is powerful. There's the power. And the voice of the Lord is full of majesty. It gives you knowledge and wisdom when you listen to that voice. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon, the, the largest cedars in the world that, uh, of that type and so plentiful, always used to symbolically represent our people even. Verse six, he maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Surion, that's Mount Hermon, which is to say the breastplate like a young unicorn. There's no such thing as a unicorn, it's wild ox. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. I want you to absorb that and I want you to know that divideth means control. So let's read it that way. The voice of the Lord controls the flames of the fire. He is a consuming fire. Why? Because he loves his children, all of them, that follow him especially. Verse 8, the voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. That's the holy, even the holy wilderness. He shakes it. He's in control. Um, I don't know, have you ever stood on the ground when a thunder and a lightning bolt hit real close to you and you felt the ground shake? He shakes things. He can. His voice shakes things. And that is an analogy to let you know exactly what we're talking about here. Verse nine, the voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calf. He created nature and birth uh, and discovereth the forest. And in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. Glory being another attribute of the spirit of the living God. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king for Ever. Not just a little while, friend. You're in a service when you're in God's service that is eternal. You're not a part time. You're not just happening by, just a flash. It's throughout the eternity. Verse 11 to complete. The Lord will give strength. That's another one of the attributes. I hope you've caught, kept count. Uh, unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. So, do you need strength? That's where you get it. Do you need peace, peace of mind? That's where you get it. It's from our Heavenly Father through His Word. And to understand that Word, whereby you have the simplicity in which Christ teaches. Now, 
with those attributes and the voice of the God, that thundering command, if you're wise enough to pick from his word what the thunders mean, because they are sealed except to God's elect. So turn with me, if you would, back to the New Testament, the book of St. John, chapter 12. St. John chapter 12, I will call your attention to verse 1 for a time sequence. Verse 1 reads, then Jesus six days before the Passover, that time is important, log it in your mind, six days before Passover this message came, that is to say except for verse 12. What does verse 12 say? On the next day, where is the next day? Five days before Passover, just like the five stones that David picked up. Five days before that Passover, these events transpire. The prophecy that Christ gives us, gives to the ears of his election. Skip to verse 23 for me and think and absorb the spirit and the voice of the living God. Verse 23, and Jesus answered them saying, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. One of the attributes. Okay. Verily, verily, you can count on it. Truly, truly, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Christ knew if he did not go through the crucifixion for you, whereby you have salvation from that, then it would bring many in truth to the very feet of the cross with him, loving him, following him. And naturally as it was at that Passover, he was the crucified lamb. Verse 25. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. In other words, if you only work forward to what you can gain in this world, you're in a heap of hurt. But if you look to him, if you look to the cross, if you look to the many, your brethren that follow him, then we see the many, the many-membered body of Christ. Verse 26, if any man serve me, let him follow me. He set the example. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Honor another one of the attributes, the voice of God. And he will honor you when you do your best. None of us are perfect. We all slip sometimes. Verse 27, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. In other words, I wouldn't change anything is what Christ is saying. I'm doing this for the children. Emmanuel, God with us, doing it for you so that your sins can be washed away, can be cleansed, and you can have that peace of mind which comes from his word which is eternal. Verse 28, and he continues, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. It's interesting that you should make note of that word again. That's, that's a double header there. And naturally it comes at the second advent <clears throat> and it comes with the price he paid on that cross. Verse 29, the people therefore that stood by and heard it, I'm sorry, verse 28, glorify thy, from, and Father glorify thy name, then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And naturally that voice from heaven was what? Verse 29, the people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. One of the thunders, 
that's issued that you should know and is very important in your life today. Five days before Passover, verse 30, listen carefully. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. And I say to you today, for your sakes, it came five days before Passover. 31, now, oh, what does this now mean? Five days before Passover. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Well, who is this prince of the world? It's the Antichrist, of course. Five days before Passover, in the year that it transpires, he will be cast out. You are given a beautiful time there, the voice of God through the thunders that were sealed. But the ears and mind of the elect opened, whereby they can hear and understand and see the beauty in which our Father teaches us, leaving nothing unturned, telling us beforehand events that transpire so that we are servants. Because if a servant knows and understands and is aware, they will serve through their faith and love of Almighty God. Verse 32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to me. And this he said, signifying death, uh, of, that he should die, of course. And that's what brought it forth. But he made that note and that special thunder from heaven on that day, at that time, for the ears of those that are supposed to hear and understand, to know what that thunder meant. Five days before Passover, the prince of the air, Satan, was cast out upon to the earth, the will be, that is to say. Now, that should remind you of a scripture. It should be in the book of Luke, and it should be starting through your mind as one of God's elect. You remember, well, that's Luke 10. Let's go there. Luke chapter 10, I want to pick it up with verse 17. I want to, first, I want to tell you what's happening here in case you forget. He had sent out the disciples, given them power, as he always gives his servants power. Did you hear what I said? He always gives his servants power over the enemy, over evil spirits, and over anything that would come against his children. And they returned, and even having known it was the Lord Jesus Christ that gave them that authority, they still say in verse 17, and the 70 returned again in joy, with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Don't ever forget that. There is power in the name of the Lord. Okay, now verse 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now, now wait a minute, it didn't say thunder. No, it said lightning. What follows lightning? Thunder. This is that time when Satan falls. He's telling you. He said, you, they have, you have power over evil spirits, but I'm going to give you power over he that comes five days before Passover, most likely. And that way you will know and understand that in Christ's name, the true Christ, you have power even over the false one. So, um, and, and he continues then, behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. You can believe that. You know, so many people I can sense by questions sent in, they fear that moment. You don't have to. Nothing by any means in your faith in making that stand against the false one, nothing can hurt you. Your father looks after his own. He stands, he controls the fire, he controls the water, he controls all things. 
and especially when the false one is here, he will be in control utilizing his people. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You know what? You're in the book of life. It means written there even before the foundations of this world as God's election. Written there. That's what you want to be thankful for is that you made the stand against him even in the first earth age. Don't let that throw you. It's a fact. Always judge spiritually by spiritual facts. That's pretty well documented. 21, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, what did he say? Rejoice because he saw Satan fall upon us. What did he say? I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, they haven't got a clue, and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. And of course, those babes were that final generation that would live as God's election, and see that truth and that knowledge would flow over the buds of their mind to stand against this one, having power and authority to not fear, but to conquer the devices of the wicked one. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth whom, who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the, fa the Son shall reveal him. I don't know, he'll reveal him to you if you'll listen if you pay attention to his teachings, if you listen to the voice of the Lord and absorb it, he's not gonna leave you hanging out somewhere not knowing what comes next. He's going to share with you. Verse 23, and he turned him unto the, his disciples and he said privately, blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. And I will say that again to you today. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see today, because there are many that are so very wise. They've got all kinds of titles behind their name, DDD and DD this and BS that. Okay. <laughs> uh, but they haven't got a clue okay. what's going down. Do you know why? In simplicity, they have not studied the Word of God. They do not understand the voice of God whereby they can hear, see, and understand. 24, for I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. They listened, they wanted that. You understand that? Even the prophets wanted to hear and live in this generation in which you live, in which he utilizes the voice of God, the thunders sealed, the little book he handed, if you'll dig, you'll know what the thunders are. And one of the thunders announces the appearance of the false one, where you're not caught off guard. That's very important. That for always be prepared and you're ready for battle, spiritually speaking. And so it is. Now, let's return back to the great book of Revelation, chapter 16. Revelation, chapter 16. Verse 12. The voice of the Lord. And the sixth angel... I, I want to say one thing. I want you to remember when the 10th chapter we begin reading about the seals, you were still under the power of the sixth trump. You understand that? Because naturally it's in the sixth trump that what happens? Satan's cast out. You just read from the voice of the Lord. Probably how that will come to pass because it is specifically recorded six days down to five and boom. Chapter 16, verse 12, being, having been under the, still the sign of the sixth trump, that's not the seventh, but the sixth, we read verse 12 of 16. 
the sixth vial, of course. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. That's the one we're watching today, even. And the waters thereof were dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. The swarming and dislodging and brotherhoods taking over. And you know something? Most people don't have a clue what the brotherhood is. The four demonics turn loose and they're operating full time. Verse 13, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. They weren't frogs. It said like frogs, meaning uh, kind of gross come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now, you know, what is said by Satan, does that frighten you? It shouldn't. Why? We just read, you have power over those things. In the name of what? Christ, of course. So frogs don't bother you. Satan's words don't bother you because you're a child of the living God and you understand the voice of your Lord. And the voice of your Lord you will follow. Why? You love him because of the price he paid for you that you can be what you are, a loved child of God. That's priceless. That brings peace of mind. That brings understanding. 14, for they are the spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of of God Almighty, and it's coming. That'd be the seventh trump when the seventh vial is poured out. He'll do most of that fighting, but we lead up to it. And so it is. One more verse to complete this lecture. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth. Are you watching? Are you studying? Are you watching the times? Are you watching the thunders? And keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Your righteous acts of watching weave the fine linen that you wear as robes in, in, in hev the heavenly body. How precious our Father's word is. The voice of the Lord. And the voice of the Lord is mighty. You know, this is kind of a short lecture, but a lot in it if you have eyes to see and if you have ears to hear. You learn from God's word. Six days, five days, bingo. Something we're supposed to watch very closely. Why? He told you, it's time. That is the time. Now, what year will that happen in? That we don't know. But because it is revealed to us this day, along with the Euphrates and the Swarmers, then we know we're getting pretty close. We're counting time, certainly. So, there you have the voice of the Lord. What is it? I think you can absorb that. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And know this, even the prophets wanted to know what you know today. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting light in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination. We don't judge people. As, today, as today's lecture goes, God is the judge. We judge no man. 
Uh, but uh, God certainly does. You do have the right for spiritual discernment to know who to listen to, though. Listen to your Father. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure hearing from you. Now, you've got a prayer request. You don't need the number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. He loves you. He may not love what you do always, um, but he does love you, and he wants that love return. If you want part of that power, you must love him and let him know that makes his day. You can read in the last verse of Revelation chapter 4, he created all things for his pleasure. That means you. You either give him pleasure or you're probably not going to receive any blessings, okay? It's that simple. Let him know you love him. That pleasures him. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct. Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. We're going to go with <clears throat> Marie from Texas. If I can't understand the book of Revelation, what other book in the Bible can I read that uh, is like Revelation? No, no, I, I don't want you to go there. I want if if you if if you've had my tapes on Revelation, I don't think you probably have. Study it with me. You can order the book of Revelation, or it'll be taught. It'll be a while before it's taught on television, but it will be again. <clears throat> but until then, it's better that you order the tapes or CDs and let me lead you through Revelation because it means to reveal. God wants you to know what it says. It's important. It's simple. But sometimes you need a teacher and to, to take you through it, that word. So uh, I, I don't want you to go somewhere else because... If you can't understand the revealing, you have a problem, but I know you can. Uh, and with my help, I know certainly that you can, and I highly recommend that you do that. Uh, you could, I could tell you that uh, the book of Daniel is simply an overlay of the book of Revelation, but if you didn't understand Revelation, you sure wouldn't understand Daniel. So you need a little bit of help there, and that'll get it for you. Robert from Illinois. You said Satan will be released this year, 2012. Can you please explain this more? I did not say that. Okay. The only thing you could have heard me say is that we're in the generation of the fig tree and Satan will be released during that generation. But uh, the year certainly was not mentioned. I, I know a lot of people are getting nervous about December of 2012 because the Mayan calendar ends there, so it, but it's just the end of a segment, okay? It's supposed to start over then uh, again, but uh, it will be interesting to see what happens there, an interesting time, but I did not say Satan would come this year. He will come to this generation because we're in the generation of the fig tree. Uh, Stacy from North Carolina, um, okay, when teaching the book of Jeremiah, you mentioned that there are pictograms, pictograms, okay, in, in the Bible. I don't, I didn't catch the verses or meaning, so can you please, uh, where they are located in the Bible, and please explain how to do our homework on searching and edifying the pictograms. It's, it's not picture grams, it's pictogram, okay? And what are pictograms? Okay, it is the particular one you're talking about is Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 26. A pictogram, and it's done two times. It's done again, and if I remember right, in the 51st chapter. And it is the word translated shishak. Shishak. Now, what, what makes it a pictogram is they take the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet and make it the first, and make the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet the last, and so on and so forth until it, it makes, could we say, a crossword puzzle, okay? In other words, there's a hidden message within it. What, what it ends up actually being is BBL, which is what? Babylon. It's Babel or confusion. 
And uh, that's what the pictogram is. Why would God do that? He wants your attention. He wants you to understand there are a little deeper truths. So he makes it a pictogram. And th there are two of them. There's more than that, but two using Shishak. And that's how you will find it. If you have a companion Bible, it explains that for you in the column, the side column. You see, some English people are not great scholars in, in, in Aramaic or Hebrew or Greek, but the person who put together the companion Bible was a fantastic scholar in both Aramaic and Hebrew and in Greek. He was so good at translating that he is the only Christian that Ginsburg allowed to proofread the Masaba. Okay, uh, that's saying a lot. That may not mean a lot to some people, but that's a that's a that's tall cotton. Okay, and certainly um, that that uh, edifies and God leads, God directs, and how good it is. But a companion Bible would help you on that. Okay, Peter from North Carolina. Pastor Murray, thank you and your sons and staff. You're welcome. If the elect are going to blow Satan's cover as Christ, why would he even bother with them? If I were him, I would run from the elect and ignore them. Does he have to deal with the elect because it's God's orders? No, you, you underestimate Satan. How much of the world do you think Satan has following him? practically all of it. Do you think, I mean, he's supernatural. He thinks that he's good enough. He can have the, even the elect eating right out of his hand. You see, you're underestimating him. He's going to go for you to win your heart, buddy. So you, you want to be set for that, all right? That's, he thinks he's that good. And why wouldn't he? Most of the world whores after him. They think he's a great guy. <clears throat> and laugh at Christians. Okay, we got um, Noreen from Louisiana. My question is this. I am aware not to wish good tidings and so forth to those who follow false teachings, but what about my wishing my boss a nice day off when he comes, uh, does not have to work? It, it, it's, you know, you have to use... God places convictions on people. That means he lets you know when he doesn't want you to do it. It seems to me like your boss is pushing religion at work, don't you? That's a mistake. That's where you make your uh, livelihood. That's where you make your income so you can teach God's word somewhere else and plant seeds and everything. Don't do it at work. But um, I, what I'm telling you, don't fall into his trap, okay? He may, uh, he's a little bit on the ignorant side, <clears throat> so uh, you can, you, you're big enough that you can, you can live with that and you can figure it out, okay? But sometimes you have, to, you have to make your own decision, and so it is. But you're doing good. I'm proud of you. Scott from Wisconsin, you're welcome. Thank you for... I have... I have stage four living colon cancer. I don't know how much time I have left, but could you answer these questions on the air? Thank you. How do I properly repent? All you gotta do is tell him, Father, I repent of this so it's erased from the book of life and have a change of heart, you know? I know you have a change of heart or you wouldn't be wanting to repent. All you gotta do is let him know, Father, I'm sorry, I did it. And I. I if I cannot tolerate chemo anymore, is that okay with God? I, I cannot take being sick or suffering anymore. But hey, Scott, you know what? It's your ship. You're the one sailing her. But do you know, like in today's lecture, I said always pray for God's will. If God still has a purpose here for you, uh, even if, if you stop the chemo, if, if, if it's making you that sick where you're not having any quality of life, then if God still has a purpose for you, he'll fix it without it. Now, I'm not saying he will do that, but I'm saying that's what happens when you pray with God's will. But, uh, old partner, what I'm telling you is your body is your ship. You're the captain of it. Don't you let somebody else tell you within what you really want to do. You talk it over with the Father, 
and you go for it. You, you sail your own ship. Don't you put her on the rock, but you, you sail her proudly and bring her forth with God's will, okay? Rich from New York. I'm very, very upset about my wife leaving me with my best friend. She left without any word to me, just up and left me. I struggle immensely daily with not being able to forgive either one of them. I want to, but I haven't been able to. I've, I've been over six months now. What should I do? Well, hey, why, why, why are you worried about them? They're not fit for you. You, you don't, why, why let them bother you? You deserve better, okay? You, you deserve better than those two. Why would you let them upset your life and, um, and, and everything when they're not fit to worry about, okay? Trash is trash, okay, if that be the case. So I'm just helping you to get your head screwed on right so that you go on, that God has something much more important for you and you go for it, okay? Sorry this happened, but it happens in life, and, and if somebody's not good enough for you, sometimes God takes them out of your life. Be that as it may, and that's one way to look at it. Barbara from North Carolina. My question is about children who die before the age of accountability. I am in a Bible study group, and they believe that children are innocent and are thus saved because of their innocency of our age. Don't we all have to account to the Father for our salvation and decide to love and follow Him? I think this decision is made during the millennium. Please give me scripture to document and do children under age of accountability have an angel? But have you, haven't you ever read Matthew 19, verse 14 and 15? What did it say? They were kind of telling Jesus, they thought, well, He's tired. You get those kids out of here. Get, get, them, get them back. Get the children back. He said, you stop. Don't you ever suffer the little children to come to me. That means you bring them forth. Don't you dare try to drive them away from me. And he brought those little children forth, and what did he do? This is important. And I'm sure it's the 15th verse that he laid hands on them. If Jesus lays hands on children or anyone else, hey, they're home free, friend. So uh, I hope that helps you. God is so fair that innocent is innocent. That means exactly that. Um, they, uh, there, are, there are some people, you see, maybe what you're forgetting is there are some people that are just too good for this earth age, and sometimes Young people are taken home, I believe, for that very reason. God loves them. But it isn't because they didn't earn it and have to wait till the millennium. They earned it in the first earth age. Okay. I, I will stop there. Uh, Patty from Florida. My question is simply, I suppose, but I was wondering if the beautiful bouquet of floral arrangement that you have behind you, if they are fresh flowers, the reason I am asking is because I have been told that it's biblical to biblical order to have fresh flowers to offer up to God when we come before Him or, or the church settings. Well, when you look like I do, you got to have things on the set that kind of help out, okay? They are real, they are fresh, and they're beautiful, and uh, they, they maybe even make me look good. And, and I'm, I know God is pleased with them. Thanks for asking, but they are, they're real flowers and God, just beautiful. We thank our Father for all of his nature. Annette from Ohio, Arnett from Ohio. I was brought up in a Christian home. I was baptized when I was 15. I think of myself as a backslider. What must I do? I have always believed. Repent. That's all you have to do is you can't be saved again. Once you're saved, that's it. Christ does the saving. He doesn't fail. You can drift so far away from the salvation, backsliding, you can go to hell. But don't ask God to die on the cross again, as it states in Hebrews 6, to save you. He's already done his part. Now you have to do yours. Repent 
and let him know he forgive you, that he will forgive you and let him know you love him. My ex-wife passed and was cremated. It was her choice. That's fine, no problem. That's this this she's already with the father and and the body's back to dust. Uh, Rachel from Oklahoma. Can you tell me when a child becomes old enough to be held accountable for the their choices, no one can ever give me a definite answer. You have blessed us by teaching me and I am sharing with my children. Well, thank you. Well, uh, when a child becomes accountable, that means when they know that Christ died on the cross for our sins and when they make a commitment to him and, and with full knowledge. If you ever see uh, baptisms by the chapel, if you see a real young child being baptized, you will note Whichever pastor is baptizing that child will usually talk to them a second. You won't be able to hear it, most likely. But it's to determine if the child is accountable. And uh, uh, I would never, you know, many people would say, well, we just don't, if they're not 12 years old, we're not going to baptize them. Well, how, how would you feel if a six-year-old that loved the Lord, and bless your hearts, we've got a lot of five and six years old and even younger, that study with us in the simplicity that Christ teaches that are very accountable. They know more about the Word than a lot of adults because of proper teaching. But how would you feel if you were a pastor and a six-year-old that felt accountable, asked to be baptized, and you refused, and on the road home there was an accident and they were killed? How, how, would, how would you handle that? I mean, really, before God, how would you answer? So uh, it's best not to judge people, and it is best to know that accountability is, uh, I, I know some six-year-olds that know a lot more Bible than somebody 60, some people 60 years old. Be that as it may, Laura Lee from Pennsylvania, we do not know if there are or will be more intruders. An intruder enters our home, will, will not leave when asked are told. I want to back up. A situation occurred that could happen in my world, so I would like to know what correctly to do. My intruder enters the home and will not leave when told. We do not know if there are or will be more intruders. We do not know if they are armed or could use something in the room to harm us. We do know that persons and others can overpower us. We wonder if after, if after seeing, they will leave people who can ID them alive in the room, there is more than one person that can kill if killing should be take place. Question, we wonder if a window of opportunity opens, do we or can we kill them considering the above? And if this happens in a place in the community, do rules apply morally? as home or, you know, it's, have you ever read First uh, Timothy chapter 5, verse 8? A person that won't protect your own family is worse than an infidel, okay? Uh, um, Laura Lee, don't ever, uh, you know, always obey, obey your civil laws, okay? Because there are some places you're not allowed to have a weapon, but there are more equalizers than a gun. There's crossbows. There's thing. Don't 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 let somebody enter your home and bother your children. You did not invite them in. They are worthless, or they would not be there. And always make certain that you know who it that you know it's not a relative or somebody like that. Usually, <clears throat> I have a, a a way that if you hear somebody breaking into your home or coming into your home at night. A flash of light always startles a person. I don't care who they are. So you take your weapon, if it's legal in your state, and um, most states now have a permit to carry, conceal, or at least any, most any state has the right to protect your own home. Armed citizens are as it should be. 
and go to a light switch and when that door is broken through, flip that light on, it will startle them. They will probably throw their hands up. And if they are already in your house and it's obvious they have weapons in hand or something and it's not old Uncle Peck uh, or somebody else that's drunker than three sheets in the wind, you know, uh, all confused, then that's it. Protect your family. It's, you have every right to do that, okay? Don't let someone abuse your family. Get rid of them, okay? Um, you know, crime really goes down in states like Arkansas where many of us have permits to carry, okay? I mean, criminals, when we're armed and can take care of business, they don't want anything to do with us. And that's good judgment on their part. Uh, Gloria from Wisconsin. Uh, okay, when we pass from this earth and go to paradise, do we communicate with others who are all also awaiting judgment? Sure, you know your family that's already passed on and so forth. Uh, and uh, communication, communicate, communicate. <clears throat> God is not the God of the dead, but the living. And they are very much alive, even though the flesh is turn back to dust, that person is very much alive with the Father in paradise or on the opposite side of paradise and they're communicating too, probably crying a lot in, in their um, coffin. Uh, well, they don't have a coffin in paradise, okay? They're, they can't afford one. They're just there. We know they don't have any clothing on necessarily because they don't have any righteous acts. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, they're there and that's it. And I'm going to have to get to this one in, in the next uh, broadcast. Word. Hey, why? Because they've been lied to. So you first have the main mark of one of God's elect. You know the truth. And the truth is what sets you free. So my guess is that you probably are one of God's elect. But anyone that has free will should make the stand also. So... Um, there you go. We let God take care of that part. Catherine from Texas. Where I live, almost everyone believes the rapture's doctrine. I have learned to plant a seed not to go all out. It just makes them angry. This is a good, there is a good chance I will be delivered up. How will I know if it's the Holy Spirit speaking through me? You will know. You intuitively will know. And it is true. When you're planting seeds, you don't dump the whole bucket on them, okay? It doesn't matter how much you know. It's that you must plant a seed that will bring them up to where you are if that seed will sprout. But only God can make that seed sprout. We can't. And uh, so that is. That's God's nature. And God, God knows who he wants and who he doesn't want right now. He wants all of his children to love him, but there is this sacred order of things. Clinton from Kansas. You're welcome for, well, I enjoy the teaching. Several years ago, you baptized me in a little creek not far from the church. During the baptism, I couldn't help but notice uh, several little fish jumping out of the water. It seemed like they were celebrating. I couldn't help from feeling that it was the presence of the Lord. Well, he's always present in a baptism. That Holy Spirit is always there. That's why we always anoint before baptism. It's a sacred thing. My question is, did God create us in the first earth world age at all at the same time, or do we believe we were done through one? No, it, he did. It's probably, read, um, uh, Proverbs chapter 8, Wisdom Speaking, and uh, it pretty well documents it, okay, for you. That would be Proverbs chapter 8, where wisdom speaks. Wisdom was with God from the beginning. Wisdom is something you never want to lack, if at all possible. The beginning of wisdom and knowledge is to love God. Andy from Minnesota. My, my wife and I have been learning so much from your program and would find it very hard to go without your ministry. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We are both in our 50s and feel we have missed so much by 
not knowing what the Bible truly says. Thank you for helping us understand God's letter as it should be intended. Well, thank you. Uh, when Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan, was Satan in spiritual or flesh body? In his natural body. Satan has a natural body. He is a cherubim. And uh, earlier in this uh, lecture, well, the lady had it spotted. And in Ezekiel chapter 28, it declares he is a cherubim. Okay? Is the Lord's day immediately following the death of Satan? No, no, no. Uh, he's, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years with us. Okay? So the Lord's day is during that time when the Lord returns for 1,000 years. The truth is taught. And all that do, ha, did not have an opportunity to learn truth, this is not a second chance. Because they didn't have a chance to start with. They are all taught, and God's elect will teach them. That's what we were talking about, God was talking about earlier when he said, you're going to teach angels. But they're in angelic bodies. They're spiritual bodies. And, um, but Satan doesn't die until the end of the millennium. Uh, Revelation chapter 20 in the very last verse. And I'm out of time. Then that begins the new age. You'll read of it in Revelation 21. It's perfect. There's no tears. Why? Satan's gone and everybody that's, uh, that deserves it. Out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Makes his day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to bless you. You can count on it. Father does love his children. He loves you and, um, and uh, wants you to return that love. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings if we have helped you. You help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. He wants you to love him. Most important, though, you listen and you listen good. You stay in his word every day. In his word, it's a good day even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.